Hi, my name is Chris Cool, and I am uh, one of the organizers here at uh, Cloud Native Rejax, and I'm also a program manager at Microsoft, uh, previously uh, one of the founders at Kinfolk. Um, so today we have Joe Thompson here, uh, who just gave his presentation. Um, Joe, maybe uh, you can uh, get us started by a little more in-depth uh, introduction to yourself, how you came into this like container space. I'm sure you were, I'm sure you were active in technology before that. Uh, so yeah, maybe you can uh, introduce us a little deeper, more deeply to yourself. Sure, sure thing. Uh, great to be here. And yeah, uh, I kind of got into IT. Uh, it was almost by default. I got into IT uh, when and because I dropped out of college. And really the only marketable skill I had at that point was getting people connected. And we're talking back in 95, uh, getting people connected to the campus dial-up system so they could connect to the internet through the university. And so there were a lot of ISPs starting up in Charlottesville around that time. And so I ended up getting a job at one of them doing basically the same thing for their customers. It was literally like just that it was a transferable skill. And uh, I, you know, in the meantime, I had been picking up Unix by just spending way too much time in the computer lab at, at the university. And uh, so between those two things, I was actually able to kind of bootstrap an IT career out of that. Uh, I did ISP support for a couple of years. I worked at an online game company doing game support for a couple of years after that. Uh, and then I went to work at a startup in Northern Virginia. That was really my first job as a system administrator doing Linux system administration. Um, and, you know, I had a little bit of a pause in my career after 9-11 and ended up working. But then I got back into IT fairly quickly. I moved up to uh, the Baltimore area and, you know, more around DC and started working. I worked desktop support and a little sysadmin for Johns Hopkins University for a while. And then I started doing government contracting and government contracting was actually where I started doing that in 2007. Uh, that was where I started getting into, you know, as you look back from the standpoint of today, you could look back and you could say, oh, that's where all the cloud native stuff really started happening. It was, you know, 2007, uh, everybody was starting to get really excited about this cool VMware thing. Uh, they were virtualizing all their data centers. And so I got into that and uh, about maybe four years of government contracting, I jumped over to Red Hat and that was where I really picked up cloud things in earnest, uh, working at Red Hat as a consultant and got introduced after a couple of years, uh, and it was with the release of RHEL 7 that they incorporated Docker into. And so I started getting into containers. And then shortly after that, I took an internal training class where they introduced us to Kubernetes. And I said, wow, that's really awesome. Uh, well, what year you know, was that? A, that was 2015. That was actually like February of 2015. So I don't it's think Kubernetes was on. even... It, yeah, it's kind yeah, of amazing. It was, they actually even had material back then. Yeah, it was it was like it it was really almost an add on at the end. It was like, okay, so what can you do with all this container stuff in Red Hat Atomic Host, uh, which was kind of Red Hat's answer to CoreOS Linux. And so the what you can do with it is you can run Kubernetes, and then Kubernetes lets you do all these things. Really, at the time, mostly what Kubernetes allowed you to do was create pods and create a service. And, you know, it was far enough back that a lot of the things that we take for granted in Kubernetes now, like deployments and stateful sets and ingress control, that didn't exist yet. You know, the community really hadn't even gotten along the line to experiencing enough pain to figure out what should these things even look like for a real, you know, real world production use case. Mm -hmm. Kubernetes at that point was still very much a, this is how we ran infrastructure at Google. This is how Kubernetes does it. And we're still figuring out how the rest of the world needs to do it. Yeah, I remember CoreOS always talking about, what is it? Uh, a Giphy, what was that? Uh, Google Google infrastructure for everyone else. Right, right. And, and so that's yep. the way we got to know each other a little bit. Uh, you know, we did, we did contracting work uh, for... CoreOS, we were building Rocket uh, as you're, you know, you're wearing the shirt, um, and and so, you know, that that's kind of where I we got to know that you existed, and uh, maybe you can talk about, you know, at that point, that's like really digging into containers, and I know you've been for, uh, you've worked for a few other container companies. Maybe you can walk us through that part of your. Career. Yeah, so that was, you know, like I said, February 2015 first exposure to anything like Kubernetes. And, and, you know, it was a very, very early, early version of Kubernetes. And probably about six months later, uh, a friend of mine who had 
been a consultant at Red Hat as well and had actually gone over to work at CoreOS and had been there for, I think, about a year, year and a half at that point, uh, a fellow named Brian Redbeard. Um, he came back to me and said, hey, we need to start hiring professional services people to do work, you know, to help support our Kubernetes distribution called Tectonic that we're about to start GAing. Uh, are you interested in coming over and working on that? And I said, 100% I'm interested, you know, because I can see how exciting this is and how many places this, could, this is going to go. And really, I it felt like a second chance for me because one of the things that I always regretted was I was there. I was around early in the early days of Linux. And I actually knew some of the, the people who later became key players in Linux. Uh, Nat Friedman was just a guy who I hung out with in a group of friends in Charlottesville. You know, I, I actually knew Nat Friedman in his last year of high school before he went on to do all the wonderful things that he's done since then. And yeah, so I, I just kind of... I got my start in the GNOME community. And so my first ever conference, uh, as far as like, you know, in the GNOME community was going to Stuttgart and uh, for Guadic, which is the, the GNOME user. And actually, I forget what the acronym is, but it's the something European conference at the end. But uh, I, and that was actually, I went to a hackathon and Nate was was leading that. And so I think that's the only time we ever met. Uh, and I, I'm definitely sure he doesn't remember, but uh you know, that, that event actually really got me really started in open source. So it's, yeah, it's funny how yeah. you meet these people and then, you know, you kind of start, you know, uh, seeing and, them over and over. It's and I always felt like, you know, I kind of stayed in the background at that point yeah. in my career. And I always felt like if I had actually like stepped up and maybe grabbed onto something and, and taken it for a ride that I could have done a lot more interesting things than some of what I ended up doing. And so the Kubernetes thing comes along and I looked at it and I said, this is my chance to grab hold of something and go where it's going and maybe help determine how it gets there in some small way. Um, you know, I've presented at a few cube cons. I've presented at a previous cloud native rejects. Uh, every now and then I interact with somebody on Twitter and they go, Hey, that's really awesome that, that you said that. And I'm like, yeah, that's a, one of the, one of the greatest compliments I've ever been given was after I gave, I think it was my second KubeCon presentation about uh, debugging tools with Kubernetes. And I had somebody come up to me afterward and he said, you know, I want to thank you for this talk because it made me not feel stupid anymore. Mm. And I was like, that, that was the whole goal, right? Like, I'm so glad that that's how you feel because the whole idea here was to say, you know more than you think you do. If you have been a traditional system administrator for five years, 10 years, 20 years, and you're just getting into containers, uh, the goal is to say your previous knowledge is not invalid. You just have to apply it in a little bit different way. You have to poke things in a different place, but the same tools work. The same concepts are still there. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of that even comes through in this talk that I did for rejects. It's like, yeah, there are still the same basic underlying concepts. Uh, you may have to go an extra step here to actually get what you want done, done. But yeah. yeah, so then with Kubernetes, I, I jumped from Red Hat to CoreOS. I worked at CoreOS for a couple of years, did a little bit more federal contracting for a while, working for a small consultancy. Um, that was, I jumped back there before CoreOS was bought by Red Hat, uh, but I was working for somebody who had been my manager's manager at Red Hat. So we actually still had a lot of friends in common. And then after that, I worked at uh, Capital One. I worked at Mesosphere right before and during the D2IQ transition. And then I jumped from Mesosphere uh, to HashiCorp where I work today. Yeah, it seems like you've worked with all the major uh, container companies in the, in the space. It's pretty amazing. Um, and, and, you know, and I think what you're, what you're saying with this talk is, and I, I think it, you know, you're, you're taking your experience and you're, you're saying, hey, look, here's, here's the, here's the, I, I guess you, you call it, uh, you know, spikes that I, that I, that I've run into and you're trying to help. And that's what you were just trying to say. Make, make, make people not feel so stupid. Yeah. And, and the genesis of it was actually, I had an interaction on Twitter with somebody. Well, there were two. The, the immediate one was I had an interaction with Twitter on somebody and it was a debate about kind of something that was happening where Kubernetes behaved in a way that seemed non-intuitive. And I was like, yeah, if you were coming to this from your background as a regular system administrator, uh, you would look at that and you go, well, that's the wrong behavior. But the underlying reality of Kubernetes is because of the way Kubernetes is constructed, this is the actual most natural behavior for Kubernetes to have. 
And so I kind of went, you know, there's other things like that, right? Like the separation between events around scheduling of a pod and the actual logs that come out of a pod. I mean, to me as a sysadmin, I expect logs about a process to all be in one place. I just go look at the logs, right? But in Kubernetes, you have to kind of assemble things from multiple sources. And in fact, you know, if it has multiple containers, you have to put those container logs together. And there are tools to help with some of this. But the fundamental underlying reality is you're still assembling the picture, the picture from puzzle pieces. And it's like the reason for that is because of the way Kubernetes is constructed. And so it's not that it's wrong. It's just it's coming from a different set of premises. Yeah. And, and so in this talk, you, you talk about a number of things. You, you kind of create a list of these. And for me, I always wonder, OK, if that's on the list, what just what what were the things that didn't quite make it? Yeah. And actually, one of the biggest ones that didn't quite make the list was the behavior of network policy with node port services. And that was, you know, like I said before, there were kind of two generators of this talk. And that was the second one which was, it was a conversation I had at a KubeCon a couple of years ago uh, with one of the one of the core maintainers. I, I can't remember which one, um, but it actually got a little bit tense because I was like, well, look, okay, as a system administrator, as somebody who's implementing security policy, my expectation is if I define a network policy, it is the policy. It applies to all traffic coming into that cluster. And you know, the way node port behaved at that time, at least with that network overlay violated that because no, if mm. traffic came in on node port, it bypassed network policy completely. And so it was, and finally I was like, look, I understand where you're coming from. Like, this is just the way that networking works in Kubernetes. I'm just saying, you know, it would be nice if either, ideally, if we could make it work the way people expect it to work so that we're not violating the principle of least astonishment or at least to better document it. And one of the reasons that didn't make this talk, even though it was kind of why I did it in the first place, is going back and looking at the behavior of network policy now with the network overlays that I was using in my test cluster, it actually seemed like it was behaving the way it should, but then reading the documentation to see like, oh, did I just happen to hit a happy case? Uh, it seems like the behavior of it is very complex and even in some cases undefined. And so it's very hard to make any general statement about it at all that, you know, you have to do this or you should not ever do this uh, with network policy and node port. It's very hard to make those kind of statements. And so I feel like you could almost do a 30 or, or even 60 or 90 minute talk just about how Kubernetes network policy and node port interact. And it just got to be of a scale that I couldn't fit it in. Okay. And another thing you talk about is this, um, you know, graduation schedule that or or, or process that um, Kubernetes has from alpha, beta, and stable. And one of the big things uh, that you actually mentioned in your in your in your talk is PSPs, uh, pod security policies. And those were so they were around so long in beta that everybody just kind of took them as given and that they would definitely graduate. And I think people were surprised, uh, at least who weren't following the conversations, uh, when that didn't happen. Is there kind of an expectation when things um, that uh, when, you know, when things are around so long that the maintainers um, should probably, um, uh, I don't know, think of the users a little more because it was it was really a surprise for a lot of folks. And um, I don't know, what, what, what was your take on that? It was a little bit of a surprise for me, too, and, and in particular because it was announced that pod security policies were going to be deprecated. It was announced that they were going to be long before they actually were, and so this has been kind of an ongoing conversation. And to give the community maintainers credit, I think the reason they said that that far in advance was that they were asking for input from the community on what should replace it so that we don't end up deprecating it without a replacement that we know is coming. And that's kind of the situation they're in today. If you go read the, the blog post about the deprecation of pod security policy, uh, they kind of promise that there is work ongoing. Uh, I don't think that work is at, quite at the point where they feel like they can talk about it yet, what shape it's going to be when it's done. But there is work ongoing, but I think they really wanted it to be further along. And I think really they just got to a point where they said, we either have to do this before even more people count on it for even more, you know, production deployments, uh, 
or we have to give up on the idea of doing it and say pod security policy is going to go GA and then immediately we're going to pivot and work on the next thing that's going to replace it. And nobody wanted to do that either because that's like doing a lot of work that you know you're going to throw away. So, you know, I think if if there was anything I would have done differently if I were in charge, you know, if I were the grand poobah of Kubernetes, I would have said something like features have, you know, a limited beta lifetime. Your, your beta phase can only last so many releases and then you either get deprecated or you go on the path to GA. And, you know, because you just have to cut it off at some point because otherwise you get into this situation where it's just been there so long, people do almost start to assume, well, it's going to go GA eventually because it's been in beta for four years. Yeah. And that's just not the case. That's not what happened. Yeah. So um, we're about at the end here, uh, but, you know, you start your talk off about, uh, you know, uh, 80s games. Uh, is there one other is there one other 80s game you would call out uh, as far as uh, you know that people should uh, maybe uh, take a look at oh i tell you what my favorite 80s game of all my favorite 80s game of all time that i played besides the real like the classics that everybody played like pac-man i fed so many quarters into pac-man machines it was one of the first games cartridges that we got for our first atari um but the one that i still like look for and play even today uh, is probably the good old Galaga um, mm. and not Galaxy. And I've tried Galaxy and I don't know, it just never resonated with me, but Galaga, maybe because it was the first one that I ever ran into when I was, you know, five or six or seven years old. Uh, and also the idea that you could, if they had a game mechanic that you don't see in a lot of games, which is you can let one of your ships get captured. And then get it back later, and then you can link them up, and you get a like a double blaster effect, and that was really cool because in most games, when you lose something, it's gone. You're not getting it back, uh, and in Galaga, that wasn't always true. You could lose a ship to the little the little um, tractor beam ships, and then still get it back, and even that could be an advantage. That was a strategy in the game to give it up and then get it back later. Cool. Well, uh, thanks so much, Joe. Uh, and thanks for your time here, and thanks for your presentation. Uh, is there any last words you'd like to leave us with? I, I guess I would go back to you know something that I said earlier and something that I said in my previous talk at, uh, at KubeCon 2018, which is you know more than you think. Um, and kind of building off of that, if you make an assumption about something in Kubernetes and you find out that that assumption is not true, that Kubernetes does not behave the way that you've assumed, uh, it doesn't mean that you didn't know what you were talking about. It just means that Kubernetes works differently, thinks a little bit differently than systems you've run into in the past. Uh, it's mm -hmm. one of those kind of live and learn things. That's why I advocate testing so heavily at the end of the presentation, because it will save you from those situations. The worst time to learn that you made a bad assumption is right after you push the deploy to prod button and it blows up in your face. <laughs> okay, wise words. Thank you so much, Joe, uh, and bye to everybody. Thank you. Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.